Chapter One of Handy Mandy in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Handy Mandy in Oz by Ruth Plummy Thompson. Chapter One Mandy Leaves the Mountain. What a butter! What a butter! High and clear above the peaks of Mount Mern floated the voice of the goat girl calling the finest, fattest, but most troublesome of her flock. All the other goats were winding obediently down toward the village that perched precariously on the edge of the mountain. But of what a butter there was not a single sign nor whisker. Serves me right for spoiling that contrary creature panted mandy pushing back her thick yellow braids with her second best hand always wants her own way that goat so she does what a butter i say what a butter come down here this instant but only the tantalizing tinkle of the goat's silver bell came to answer her for what a butter was climbing up not down and there was nothing for mandy to do but go after her Muttering dire threats, which she was much too soft-hearted ever to carry out, the rosy-cheeked mountain lass scrambled over crags and stones, pulling herself up steep precipices, the goat always managing to keep a few jumps ahead, till soon they were almost at the top of the mountain. Here, stopping on a jutting rock to catch her breath and remove the burrs from her stockings, Mandy heard a dreadful roar and felt an ominous rumbling beneath her feet what a butter on a narrow ledge just above heard it too and cocked her head anxiously on one side perhaps she had best jump down to mandy after all the great silly girl did feed and pet her and from the sound of things a storm was brewing if there was one thing the goat feared more than another it was a thunderstorm so rolling her eyes as innocently as if she had not dragged mandy all over the mountain she stretched her nose down toward her weary mistress pleaded wada butter affectionately oh by yourself fumed mandy making an angry snatch for nanny goat's beard pets and children are all alike never appreciate a body till they have a stomach ache or a thunderstorm is coming now then molass be quick with you holding out her strong arms mandy made ready to catch the goat as it jumped off the ledge but before wada butter could stir there was a perfectly awful crash an explosion and up shot the slab of rock on which mandy was standing up up and out of sight entirely where the mountain girl had been a crystal column of water spurted viciously into the air so high the bulging eyes of the goat could see no end to it rearing up on her hind legs what a butter turned round and round in a frantic effort to catch a glimpse of her vanishing mistress then thinking suddenly what would happen should the torrent turn and fall upon her the goat sprang off the ledge and ran madly down the mountain bleeding like a whole herd of banshees and mandy as you can well believe was as frightened as water butter and with twice as much reason the first upheaval as the rock left the earth flung her flat on her nose grasping the edges of the slab with all hands mandy hung on for dear life and as a stinging shower of icy water sprayed her from head to foot wondered what under the earth had happened to her thorns and thistles could the thunderstorm really have come up instead of down certainly it was raining up and whatever was carrying her aloft with such terrible force and relentlessness how could the goat girl know that a turbulent spring pent up for thousands of years in the center of mount mern had suddenly burst its way to freedom and you have no idea of the tremendous power in a mountain spring once it uncoils and lets itself go mandy's rock 
might just as well have been shot into the air by a magic cannon first it tore upward as if it meant to knock a hole in the sky then still traveling at incalculable speed began to arch and take a horizontal course over the mountains hills and valleys west of mern all poor mandy knew was that she was hurtling through space at breakneck speed with nothing to save or stop her the long yellow braids of the goat girl streamed out like pennants while her striped shirt and voluminous petticoats snapped and fluttered like banners in the wind what a butter oh what a butter moaned mandy gazing wildly over the edge of the rock but pshaw what was the use of calling what a butter even if she heard could not fly after her through the air and when she herself came down not even her own goat would recognize her at this depressing thought mandy dropped her head on her arms and began to weep bitterly for she was quite sure she would never see her friends her home or her goats again but the rough and frugal life on mount mern had made the goat girl both brave and resourceful so she soon dried her tears and as the rock still showed no sign of slowing up nor dashing down she began to take heart and even a desperate sort of interest in her experience slowly and cautiously she pulled herself to a sitting position and still clutching the edges of the rock dared to look down at the countries and towns flashing away below after all sniffed the reckless maiden nothing very dreadful has happened yet i've always wanted to travel and now i am traveling not many people have flown through the air on a rock why it's really a rocket decided mandy with a nervous giggle and that i suppose makes me the first rocket rider in the country and the last too she finished soberly as she measured with her eye the distance she would plunge when her rock started earthward now if we just come down in that blue lake below i might have a chance perhaps i could jump but by the time mandy made up her mind to jump the lake was far behind and nothing but a great desert of smoking sand stretched beneath her end of chapter one chapter two of handy mandy and oz by ruth plummy thompson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the end of the ride the sky from the rosy pink of late afternoon had faded to a depressing gray and mandy could not help thinking longingly of the appetizing little supper she had set out for herself before going up to call the goats who would eat it now or even know she was flying through the air like a comet no one she concluded drearily for mandy was an orphan and lived all by herself in a small cottage on mount mern high above the village of fistickens in a day or two some of her friends in the village might search the cottage and find her gone but now now there was nothing to do but sit tight and hope for the best mandy's next glance down was more encouraging instead of the dangerous-looking desert she was sailing over misty blue hills and valleys dotted with many small towns and villages high as she was she could even hear the church bells tolling the hour and this made mandy feel more lost and lonely than ever all these people below were safely at home and about to eat their suppers while she was flying high and far from everything she knew and loved best hungrily the goat girl cast her eyes over the rock she was riding thinking to find a small sprig of mountain berries or even a blade of grass to nibble at first glance the rock seemed bare and barren then sticking out of a narrow crevice mandy spied a tiny blue flower poor little posy it's as far from home as i am murmured the goat girl and carefully breaking the stem she lifted the blue flower to her nose 
Its faint fragrance was vaguely comforting, and Mandy had just begun to count the petals when the rock gave a sickening lurch and started to pitch down so fast Mandy's braids snapped like jumping ropes and her skirts bellied out like a parachute in a gale. "'Now for it!' gasped the goat girl, closing her eyes and clenching her teeth. "'Oh, my poor little shins!' Mandy's shins were both stout and sturdy, but even so we cannot blame Mandy for pitying them. Stouter shins than hers would have splintered at such a fall. Hardly knowing what she was doing, Mandy began to pull the petals from the blue flower, calling in an agonized voice as she pulled each one the names of her goats and friends. She had just come to Speckle, the smallest member of her flock, when the end came. Kimini Jiminy! Was this all? Opening one eye, the goat girl looked fearfully about her. She was sitting on top of a haystack. No, not a haystack, but a heap of soft blue flower petals, as soft as down. Opening the other eye, she saw the rock on which she had traveled so far bump over a golden fence and fall with a satisfied splash into a shimmering lake. But what lay beyond the lake made Mandy forget all her troubles and fairly moan with surprise and pleasure. "'A castle!' exulted the goat girl, putting one hand over her heart. "'Oh, I've always wanted to see a castle, and now I am!' And this castle, let me tell you, was well worth anyone seeing. A castle of lacy blue marble, carved and decorated with precious stones, in a way to astonish the eyes of a simple mountain lass. From the tallest tower, a silken pennant floated lazily in the evening breeze. K-E-R-E-T-A-R-I-A -E Mandy spelled out slowly. Sliding off the heap of flower petals, she stood for a long, delicious moment lost in admiration. Then, giving herself a business-like shake to be sure she was not broken or bent by her amazing flight and tumble, Mandy turned to examine the rest of her surroundings. When she looked at the spot on which she had fallen, the stack of blue petals had disappeared but there, twinkling up cheerfully, was the blue flower as much at home as if it had grown there in the first place. Thoroughly puzzled, Mandy picked the little flower a second time and slipped it into the pocket of her apron. Even without the mystery of the blue flower, it was astonishing enough to find herself in the stately park of this gorgeous blue castle. There was a tree-lined avenue, and velvety lawns, splashed with star-shaped flower-beds, stretched in every direction. Only the small patch of land on which she was standing was bare and uncultivated. And evidently someone was at work here, for a great white ox with golden horns, yoked to a gold plow, stood with his back to Mandy, dozing cozily in the pleasant dusk. At the sight of the ox, Mandy gave a little sigh of relief and content. Long ago, an old mountain woman had given her this sensible piece of advice. When you do not know what to do next, do the first useful piece of work that comes to hand. Now here, right at hand, was a useful piece of work. And while she was trying to figure out the whole puzzle of the flying rock and strange blue flower, she might just as well be plowing. Then, when the owner of the castle saw her working so industriously, he might invite her to supper. So, grasping the tail of the ancient plow, Mandy clicked her tongue in a cheerful signal for the ox to start. The white ox, who had not seen nor heard the goat girl till this minute, turned his head in a lordly fashion and gave her a long, haughty look not really believing what he saw, he took another look, and then, with a bellow of fright and outrage, went charging across the park, pulling the startled goat girl behind him. Mandy might have let go, but she just did not think of it. 
and with pounding heart and flying braids held fast to the pitching plough as it tore through flower beds ripped up lawns and cut fearful furrows in the pebbled paths clouds of earth stones and whole plants uprooted ruthlessly from their beds showered round her ears and as they reached the palace a hard metal object hit her squarely between the eyes putting up a hand mandy caught the flying missile and mechanically slipped it into her pocket and the next instant the ox lunging through an open french window dragged her into the magnificently furnished throne room of the castle not only into the throne room mind you but into the lap of royalty itself End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Handy Mandy and Oz by Ruth Plummy Thompson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 The King of Carateria The white ox, in his mad dash across the throne room, had run violently into a marble pillar hurling mandy straight into the arms of a very tall very stern and very blue-looking monarch pages and courtiers tripped and fell left and right in a scramble to get out of the way while the ox snorting and trembling looked balefully over his shoulder at the goat girl what is well, the meaning what is the meaning of this outrageous intrusion panted the king unhand me woman remove your finger from my eye and your arms your arms hi 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 the king's sentence ended in three frightened squeaks is this a girl or an octopus he puffed heaving up his chest in an endeavor to dislodge mandy I, 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 are you going to allow this clumping savage to insult my majesty in this uh, high-handed manner as the goat girl by this time scarlet from anger and mortification jumped off the king's lap three very high officials of the court of Carataria darted forward the high quick questioner the imperial persuader and the lord high upper dupper of the realm bawled a page having delivered himself of this impressive announcement the page bolted back of a curtain and from there peered with astonished eyes at the visitor everyone in the grand blue throne room looked frightened and ready to run at a moment's notice wondering what could be the matter with them all Mandy, with many misgivings, watched the counselors of Keritaria advance in a threatening row. Now then, not a move, thundered the high quick questioner, tapping her sharply on the shoulder with a golden staff shaped like a huge interrogation point. It is my duty to question all strangers who ride, fall, fly, or break into our kingdom and you the haughty nobleman gave mandy a cold blue stare you are stranger than any stranger who has ever come to carataria it is my duty to persuade you to do as his majesty commands stated the imperial persuader raising his gold spiked club and it is my duty to put you in your place sniffed the lord high upper dubber rattling a bunch of keys that hung from his belt well if you ask me puffed the ox rolling his eyes wildly round at the goat girl her place is in a museum and the sooner you lock her upper dubber the better now mandy was so astonished to hear the ox actually speaking she gave a loud cry and flung up her hands every single seven of them help help yelped the couriers scurrying like mice into corners and corridors only the white ox the king and his counselors kept their places how dare you come into a king's presence armed in this barbarous fashion gasped the high quick questioner taking a step toward the goat girl but too frightened to touch her pigs 
cried Mandy, suddenly losing her temper. Can I help my seven arms? All of us on Mount Mern have seven arms and hands, and you with your skinny, too, seem far funnier than I. I am Mandy the Goat Girl, as anyone in his senses can see. The girl is right, observed the ox, gazing more attentively at Mandy, and now speaking quite calmly. She can no more help those seven arms than you can help those seven warts on your nose, Questo. I tell you, this maiden is a real curiosity. And if you three high boys will cease rattling your teeth and your clubs, perhaps she will explain why she came to Carateria. I myself shall call her Handy Mandy. Why, the beast has more sense than its masters, thought the goat girl in surprise. Well, rumbled the king ungraciously, if you have anything to say before we lock you up, say it, but do not wave your arms about, please. Swallowing nervously, clasping four of her hands behind her back, and stuffing the other three into convenient pockets in her apron, Mandy began to speak. I was driving my goats home from the mountain, Your Majesty, when the rock on which I was standing exploded suddenly into the air, flew like a bird over hill, valley, and desert, and dropped me into your garden. <laughs> Not a bruise nor a bump to show for it, grunted the imperial persuader, elevating his nose to show he was not taken in by such a tale. In spite of his suspicious glance, Mandy decided to say nothing of the blue flower that had so miraculously softened her fall. "'And since when have rocks flown through the air?' inquired the Lord High Upper Dupper sarcastically. Ahem. <clears throat> In the garden, continued Mandy, undaunted by the two interruptions, I saw this great white ox, and thinking to do a bit of honest work for my supper, grasped the plough, but— That was a little accident, murmured the great beast in a jovial voice, for, <laughs> catching sight of a seven-armed maiden all at once and without warning, I took to my heels and landed her in her present unpleasant predicament. Is that not so, Melas? Looking at the ox with round eyes, Mandy nodded. But she has still not explained all these arms, complained the imperial persuader. Who ever heard of a seven-handed maiden? I have, asserted Mandy stoutly. And what, pray, is there to explain? This iron hand— the goat girl raised it slowly and thoughtfully as she spoke. I use for ironing, lifting hot pots from the stove, and all hard sort of hard work. This leather hand I keep for beating rugs, dusting, sweeping, and so on. This wooden hand I use for churning and digging in the garden. These two red rubber hands for dishwashing and scrubbing. And my two fine white hands I keep for holding and braiding my hair. With all seven hands extended before her, Mandy smiled engagingly up at the king. "'Undoubtedly a witch,' whispered the imperial persuader darkly, as the king, in spite of himself, gazed curiously down at his seven-armed visitor. "'A dangerous character, your majesty,' hissed the high quick questioner, shaking his head disapprovingly. "'To the dungeons with her!' rasped the lord high upper dupper rattling his keys like castanets what bawled the white ox stamping all his gold-shod feet in rapid succession you mean to consign this marvel of skill and efficiency to a dungeon what a set of dunces you are come handy i myself will take you for a slave out of my way dolts Swaggering a bit, and with the golden plough still clanking and bumping behind him, the ox ambled at a dignified pace toward the door. Mandy, though she did not relish the idea of becoming his slave, was greatly relieved at the interest the ox was taking in her case. But before following him, she looked inquiringly up at the king. "'Yes, go,' commanded his majesty harshly. 
I hereby give you into the care and service of Knox, the royal ox of Carataria. <laughs> Harm one hair of his head, and you will pay for it with your life and perish, I promise you, most ignominiously. Mercy, Ursy, muttered Mandy, tiptoeing nervously after her new master. Doesn't the fellow know any short words? How queer everything is on this side of the mountain! People with only two arms? Animals talking and giving orders to kings? <laughs> Suppose the goats at home started bossing the villagers? And what would the villagers think of her strange flight and reception in Carataria? Well, from what she herself had seen of royalty, decided the goat girl, she much preferred her goats or even the company of this haughty white ox. Stepping briskly beside him, Mandy resolved to humor the creature till she saw a bit more of the country or found some safe way back to her mountain. Knox, swinging along at his own indolent gait, paid no further attention to the goat girl. But when they reached his royal quarters, which to Mandy looked more like a castle than a stable, he began bawling so fiercely for the stable boys, she decided uncomfortably that being his slave might prove both unpleasant and dangerous. However, when six little boys, dressed in blue overalls and aprons, ran out, the royal ox addressed them quite kindly. The first, without waiting for instructions, unhitched the plough and lifted the yoke from the royal shoulders. "'Prepare Carrie's quarters for my new slave,' directed Knox, turning to the second and third. "'You others, bring dinner for two, and mind you, fetch Handy Mandy everything they have at the king's table.' With a playful nudge, Knox started them smartly on their way, then moved grandly into the huge stone stable and along to his own luxurious gold-paved stall. "'Ma, I!' exclaimed the goat girl, sinking breathlessly to a three-legged stool. "'How grand and eloquent you are here! Ma, I! I wish what a butter could see this!' "'One of your goats?' murmured Knox burying his nose in the huge marble bowl he used for a drinking trough. Mandy nodded. Ah, I wish you were here now, she added with a rapturous little sigh. Well, I don't. Deliberately, the royal ox licked the water from his lips. Do you suppose I'd allow a miserable goat in my sapphire-trimmed stall? Miserable, squealed Mandy, springing off the stool. What a butter's the smartest goat on the mountain. She wouldn't give two bleats and a ba for any old hoop a doop like you. Hoop a doop? repeated the ox in a dazed whisper. Do you mean to stand there and call the royal ox of Carataria a hoop a doop? Yes, said Mandy firmly, but backing off a bit as she spoke. What makes you think you're so much better than a goat? Even if you do talk, put on airs, and have golden horns. Well, and to Mandy's surprise and relief, Knox cleared his throat and grinned quite amiably. After all, I am the royal ox, you know, more precious to the king than all his court and subjects. Everyone jumps at my least command, so why shouldn't I put on a few airs? Besides, do you think it's polite to call me an old hoopadoop? when I've just saved you from a dungeon? No, admitted Mandy, resuming her seat thoughtfully. I don't suppose it is. Maybe you are as good as a goat, she added with a little burst of generosity. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Through half-closed eyes, the royal ox looked quizzically at the goat girl. I believe we shall get on famously, Molass, famously. The truth is, you amuse me no end, and so long as you amuse me, everything will be smooth as silk. But of course, if you bore me, I will bore you, oh, positively. Lowering his head, Knox shook his horns playfully. Now, I shouldn't try that if I were you advised Mandy, raising her iron hand and cracking the fingers warningly, for if you do, I might throw things. 
<laughs> I believe you would. The enormous beast, charmed by so much spirit and independence, fairly beamed upon his new slave. I take it you are pretty good at throwing things? Yes, and at catching them, too. Reaching up, Mandy took seven of the dozen brushes off the shelf above her head. Tossing them all into the air with three of her hands, she caught them easily with the other four. Then, dragging her stool closer, she began brushing the coat of her royal charge so hard and vigorously he blinked with pleasure and astonishment. "'Will you have your tail plain, curled, or plaited?' asked Mandy in a businesslike voice. "'Uh, uh, plain, uh, thank you.' With admiration and some alarm, Knox regarded the whirling arms of the goat girl, but the four little stable boys, appearing at that moment, stared at her in glassy-eyed fright and consternation. For Knox, they had brought a tray heaped high with corn and oats, and another with fresh sliced apples. For Mandy, there were two trays of gold dishes containing a sample of everything from the royal table. Dropping her brushes, Mandy seized all the trays at once in her various hands, which so frightened the stable boys they took to their heels, yelling at the top of their voices. Winking at the royal ox, Mandy set his supper on the gold stand meant for that purpose, then dropping to the floor before her own two trays, began her first dinner in a strange land. And what a strange land! mused Mandy, helping herself from the gold dishes with first one hand and then another. "'Well, Melaz, inquired Knox, daintily nibbling his oats and apples. "'Is this not better than bread and water in a dungeon cell?' Too full for utterance, Mandy rapturously nodded. End of Chapter 3 Chapter Four of Handy Mandy and Oz by Ruth Plummy Thompson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, The Message in the Horn. After the Goat Girl had finished her supper and the stable boys had hurried off with the trays, Knox showed his new slave to her quarters. Handy Mandy, who had expected nothing better than a heap of straw in the corner of an empty stall decided that for a slave she was faring pretty well. A small but complete apartment had been built in the wing next to Knox's stall, with not only a comfortable bedroom and bath, but a small sitting-room as well. The bed was a huge gold four-poster with blue silk sheets and comforters. Never in her hard and simple life had Handy dreamed of such elegance. "'Here, try the chairs,' urged Knox, trotting almost briskly into the sitting-room. This Mandy was only too willing to do, and the pretty little room with its bookshelves, lamps, and pictures seemed to the honest goat girl much more desirable than the palace. "'All belong to Carrie,' mumbled the royal ox, settling himself largely on a white rug beside her. "'Was Carrie one of your slaves?' asked Mandy, rocking herself cheerfully to and fro with all her hands resting quietly in her lap. "'Slave!' the ox spoke sharply. "'I should say not. Carrie was a king, our own little king, up to a few years ago. And what a lad he was, what a lad!' "'Was!' exclaimed Mandy. "'Why, what happened to him?' He disappeared, Knox told her sadly. Nobody knows how or where. Just disappeared, my girl, on a hunting trip. And this blue-nosed scoundrel who claims to be his uncle came to rule over Carateria. Since then, Knox lowered his voice cautiously. Everything is different and changed. The people are treated no better than dogs. Dogs! repeated the royal ox bitterly. Of course, this fellow cannot interfere with me, nor take any chances, for there is a prophecy on the west wall of the castle that has stood for a thousand years. What does it say? asked Mandy, leaning forward and clasping the arms of the rocker with all hands. Impressively, Knox repeated the prophecy. 
so long as the royal ox of Carateria is in good health and spirits so long and no longer shall the present king rule over the land but who wrote it mandy's rocker stopped with a surprised squeak nobody knows answered nox soberly but it has come true dozens and dozens of times each time a new king is crowned in Carateria, a new ox appears mysteriously at the royal coronation if anything happens to the royal ox the king also is destroyed ma i the goat girl now rocked very fast indeed so that's the reason they take such good care of you old toggins but tell me where do all of you royal oxen come from in the first place and how is it you can speak none of the beasts on mount mern can say a word oh that the royal ox lifted his head lazily Carateria is in the wonderful land of oz my dear handy and all oz creatures can talk even the mice and squirrels but what part of oz we white oxen really come from i myself cannot rightly say i seem to remember a great blue forest and many happy days there then one evening a silver cloth was thrown over my head and i fell into a deep and immediate slumber when i awakened i was here in Carateria, and on that same day little king kerry was crowned king of the realm from the attendants and courtiers i soon learned of this strange prophecy but the young boy king was so devoted to me and i to him i did not miss the forest or my former freedom to be near me Kerry had this apartment built in the stable and spent more than half his time in my company my life being easy and pleasant i gave little thought to the past or to the future but spent all my energies enjoying the present once in a while just for the looks of the thing i appeared in the royal processions and each day at sundown i was yoked for an hour to the golden plough and required to stand for an hour in the royal garden but i never did any real work or ploughing till you my reckless handy came along to-day but what about the little king begged the goat girl as nox lapsed into a thoughtful silence and seemed to have forgotten all about her he disappeared just as i told you the royal ox rolled his big eyes mournfully upward on this day as on many others i carried him on my back to the edge of the wood there mounting his favorite steed he rode away with the royal huntsman for an hour's sport as i returned to the castle someone struck me a terrific blow that felled me to the earth where i lay for several hours in complete unconsciousness whoever struck me down evidently thought i was finished for when i finally did regain my senses i was buried beneath a heap of loose earth and leaves still dazed and hardly knowing what i was about i struggled out and staggered back to the courtyard one of my horns had been bent during the encounter and my expression was so wild and distracted no one recognized me as boz the royal ox of little king kerry the whole castle was in an uproar for a new king had taken possession of the throne and thinking of course i was the next and new royal ox this rascally impostor named me Knox. The Caratarians, without daring to inquire what had become of their former ruler, crowned me with daisies and laurel and hurried to do the bidding of their new ruler. Why, the big cowards, said Handy Mandy, clenching all her fists. And do you mean to tell me nothing has been heard of the little king since then? Nothing. The royal ox moved his head drearily from side to side. The people think the royal prophecy has been fulfilled again, and what can they do? A farmer's boy brought word that Boz, the royal ox, had been struck down and spirited away, so naturally they felt sure that Kerry had been destroyed or taken prisoner. Then no one suspects you are really Boz and not Knox? questioned the girt girl now on the very edge of her chair oh my eye don't you see 
if you are still the same ox who came to Carateria with King Kerry, and you are still all right, he must be all right, too. That is, if the prophecy means anything. Shh! warned Knox, looking about nervously. Someone might hear you. That is what keeps me here, he went on seriously. I felt if I stay quietly in my place, Kerry would some day return, claim his own throne, and drive this miserable tyrant out of the country. Stay quietly here, when the little fellow may be needing you? cried Handy aghast. Oh, why don't you go look for him, you great big ox, you? Come on, what are we waiting for? Why, I'll drag that old rascal off the throne with my own hands, promised the goat girl indignantly waving her arms. Wait, stop! Knox sprang up with surprising lightness for one usually so ponderous and slow. Do you realize that I am treasured and watched more closely than the crown jewels? At this very moment twenty guardsmen stalk round and round the stable. I have as much chance of leaving Carateria as a goldfish has of flying through the forest. As if to prove his words, a tall soldier in a blue shako thrust his head suddenly through the window from the outside. Is everything in order and as you wish, your highness? puffed the guard, looking suspiciously at the goat girl's revolving arms. "'Everything is lovely,' murmured the ox in a sleepy voice. "'My slave here is doing her exercises, and when she finishes she will polish my horns.' At his warning wink, Handy Mandy dropped all her arms at her side. "'Well, well, a pleasant evening to you,' mumbled the soldier withdrawing his head with another disapproving look at the goat girl for a moment after he had disappeared neither spoke then handy mandy snatching a silk cover from one of the pillows fell to polishing knox's left horn for very dear life i can always think faster when i'm working she observed earnestly think away replied the ox closing his eyes so as not to see the numerous hands flashing past his nose but be careful what you say and do. If you rouse the suspicions of old King Kerr, you'll be flung into a dungeon in spite of all my influence. Now don't you be worrying about me, chortled Handy with a little wink and nod. I've been taking care of myself and a flock of goats for ten years. Say, this is a bend for sure. The goat girl ran her rubber fingers curiously along the curve in the ox's left horn, and then, with one of her sudden and kind-hearted impulses, tried to straighten the quirk with a quick twist of her wrist. Imagine, then, if you can, her horror and surprise when the golden horn came off in her hand. "'Oh, my goats and my goodness!' shuddered Handy, hopping from one foot to the other. "'What'll I do? Uh, where's some glue? Oh, my, ich, ich, I'm mighty sorry.' "'Sorry?' gulped the royal ox, glaring at the goat girl with rolling eyes and lashing tail. But before he could lunge forward, as he certainly intended to do, Handy gave a little scream of excitement. "'Oh, look!' she panted, pointing all thirty-five fingers at the base of Knox's horn. Oh, my dear ear, it screws on. There are regular grooves. Wait, I'll have it back in a jiffy. Knox, who couldn't possibly see the top of his own head, merely gave a grunt. But Handy Mandy, lifting the horn in her wooden hand, screamed again and then began to shake the horn violently. At her second shake, two silver balls tumbled out and rolled away into a corner. Scrambling after them, with Knox now as interested as she, the goat girl recovered them both and dropped breathlessly on a sofa. On closer examination, Handy discovered the balls would open as easily as cardboard Easter eggs, and with Knox's head resting heavily on her shoulder, she gave the first a quick turn. It came apart at once, and in the hollow center lay a small folded paper. Spreading it out on her knees, Handy read, in a hoarse whisper, "'Go to the Silver Mountain of 
Oz. Silver Mountain? Do you know where that is? exclaimed the goat girl, looking wildly round at Knox. No, but I'll wager my head it has something to do with Kerry. Quick, molass, open the other ball. With trembling fingers of her good white hand, the goat girl obeyed. Inside the second sphere lay a small silver key. After they had examined this and read the message all over again, Handy carefully tucked the two articles back in the silver balls and returned the balls to the golden horn. Then, hastily screwing the horn back on its base, the two began whispering earnestly together. "'Mean to say you never knew your horn came off?' questioned Handy, clasping and unclasping her hands. "'Mean to say you never heard of this silver mountain?' Oh, no, to both questions, answered the ox with an anxious little sigh. Ah, but now that we do know, we must start off at once to search for it and see for ourselves whether Carey is imprisoned there by his enemies. Though how we'll escape these guards or ever get away with half the kingdom watching, I cannot imagine. Never fear, we'll manage, promised Handy easily. Why, with your horns and my hands, it will take an army to stop us. Now get your rest, ox dear, and in the morn's morning we'll be journeying. You're right, breathed the ox, starting obediently toward his stall. I more than half believe you. Good night, then, called the goat girl softly. Don't talk in your sleep and give our plans away. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Handy Mandy and Oz by Ruth Plummy Thompson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five Out of Carateria. Knox was asleep on a heap of white flower petals in the corner of his stall, asleep and dreaming of the silver mountain of Oz, when a sharp tap on the shoulder rudely awakened him. Come, whispered an urgent voice, time to start. Come, I've managed everything. Lurching to his feet, and still in a daze, the royal ox looked askance and with no great favor at the goat girl. Why, it's not even light, he moaned feebly. Of course not, admitted Handy Mandy guardedly, but I poked my nose out the door a moment ago and saw all the guards were a bit drowsyish, so I tapped them on the head with this. Handy Mandy raised her iron hand, and with a little grimace beckoned for Knox to hurry. Come along now. We can be out of here before they know what's what or who. So Knox, with a regretful look round his comfortable stall, and a sigh for his morning bath and breakfast, moved quietly after her. While the royal creature had spent most of his time during the past two years thinking of ways to rescue his young master, now that he was actually starting out, he was filled with doubt and dismay. How could they ever find this silver mountain and overcome the enemies that most certainly would beset them? The sight of the twenty guards, lying in a stiff row, somewhat reassured the downhearted beast, and in the dim light of early morning he looked thoughtfully up at the sturdy mountain lass stepping so resolutely beside him. In each hand Mandy carried a different weapon, and resting on her broad shoulders was a rake, an axe, one guard's gun, another guard's sword, a spade, and a long-handled broom. Noting his astonished glance, the goat girl grinned, and with her one free hand touched her fingers to her lips. So, silently and without exchanging a word, the two crossed the stable-yard, the royal park, hurried through a little wood, and came out on a dusty blue highway. Now, said Handy, looking up and down the road to make sure no one was coming, now we can talk and decide which direction to take. How can we do that? objected Knox panting a little from the unaccustomed exertion before breakfast, when neither of us knows where the Silver Mountain is. Well, we have tongues, haven't we? And can ask, can't we? 
Handy Mandy rattled her weapons impatiently. But before we worry about the Silver Mountain, we must get out of Carateria, which is the quickest way to the border. Oh, North, answered Knox promptly. Carateria is in the upper part of the Munchkin country of Oz, and once we cross the northern branch of the Munchkin River, we'll be entirely out of the country. Fine, then we'll go north. And what lies beyond the Munchkin River? inquired the goat girl, shifting the axe to her left shoulder. I've never crossed myself, admitted Knox, moving along in his slow and dignified manner. But I have heard there are many mountains, and if we go far enough, the purple land of the Gilligans. Sounds interesting, decided Handy Mandy. And who knows, among all those mountains we may find the one we are looking for. Uh, by the way, am I to call you Boz, Knox, or Goldiehorns? But I believe I'll call you Knox, for somehow I like Knox the Ox best. Anything you say, yawned her companion, switching his tail negligently. But I shall always call you Handy Mandy. It suits you, my lass, and you need no longer consider yourself a slave. Oh, I never did, roared the goat girl, glancing cheerfully down at her lordly companion. That was just a joke, wasn't it? You know... Everything in this land of Oz is extremely funny and peculiar. Two armed natives, animals talking, kings disappearing, and mysterious messages and prophecies. People always think a new country strange, observed the ox philosophically. To us it seems quite right and natural. But I dare say if I were to find myself on Mount Mern, I'd consider everything there very odd and upsetting. Rocks flying through the air, for instance, and landing one soft and light as a daisy in a strange king's garden. But all of our rocks don't fly. In fact, I never knew one to do such a thing before. And no wonder I landed as soft as a daisy. There was a blue daisy under me, or I'd have been splintered to smithereens. Mm, daisy? Knox licked his lips hungrily. You never said anything about a daisy. Oh, I never tell all I know, confided Handy. Especially to high quee cockadoodlums like the king and his counselors. But there was a daisy growing on the rock, and I picked it. As I started to fall, I began pulling off the petals, and when I landed I came down on a high, huge pile of them, a heap as high as a haystack, continued Handy Mandy dreamily. So I slid off the stack and turned to look at the castle, and when I looked again, the petals were gone. But there was the daisy itself, growing up as pert as you please in this strange garden. So what did I do but pick it again? And here it is. Triumphantly Handy pulled the blue flower from her pocket. My, what a dear little daisy murmured the ox how delicious it would taste no no cried handy as knox rolled his long tongue out toward the flower it's too pretty to eat nothing's too pretty to eat replied the ox plaintively funny it hasn't wilted though well i believe it's magic stated the goat girl with a positive little shake of her head as she returned the daisy to her pocket, Handy felt the hard metal object that had hit her in the forehead when she and Knox ploughed through the king's garden. "'Look, what do you suppose this is?' she queried, tapping the ox sharply on the shoulder, for he was walking sleepily along with his eyes closed. "'This is what we dug up when we rushed through the garden, you know.' "'How should I know?' grunted the ox indifferently opening one eye just a silver hammer isn't it maybe we can trade it for a good breakfast when we cross the river my eye how you talk scolded handy we're not going to trade it at all see there's an initial on it a big w now what would w stand for who want which where oh i worry 
mumbled the ox, plodding resignedly along beside her. "'Well, anyway, it will make a splendid potato masher,' concluded the goat girl, returning the hammer to her pocket. "'Yes, if we had any potatoes,' the ox sighed heavily as he spoke, looking off into the distance with such a mournful eye, Handy Mandy laughed a little all to herself. "'Oh, cheer up!' sniffed the goat girl you're not starved yet and hurry up too the sun's going higher every moment and we'd better pass those farms before the people waken it was against nox's nature to hurry but realizing the wisdom of the goat girl's advice he broke into an awkward gallop in spite of his great weight the royal creature was light as a daisy on his feet and except for the faint rattle of handy's weapons they made little noise as they ran past the dome-shaped blue houses and barns of the munchkin farmers couldn't we stop for a few greens puffed nox looking longingly over the fence at a field of cabbages not here de ear red-faced and breathless the goat girl ran on wait till we cross this river iver but i'm not used to this sort of thing complained nox peevishly running races before breakfast on an empty stomach no bath no brush no rub down well here's your brush gasped handy picking her way through a dense thicket as the highway ended in a small wood and yonder's your bath mister my ay what a blue river everything's blue in the munchkin country of oz nox told her sulkily as sharp briars and thorns reached out to scratch his satiny hide even the royal ox of cabrataria hinted handy with a sly wink oh the river's blue and the houses are blue and even the wind blue <laughs> come on don't try to be funny with heaving sides the ox stopped on the edge of the gleaming blue stream don't try to be funny i beg oh i don't have to try i am laughed handy flinging the axe the rake the spade the sword the gun and the broomstick across the river wait snorted the ox as handy having got rid of her load raised all of her hands above her head and prepared to dive in wait can you swim i don't know but i'll soon find out cried handy and before nox could prevent it the goat girl leapt off the bank and disappeared beneath the blue waters of the munchkin river for once nox forgot his dignity and the royal station and plunged frantically after his reckless companion swimming around with his head under water he finally located handy mandy and gripping her yellow plates firmly in his teeth dragged her to the opposite bank the goat girl was so full of water she had little to say and lay soggily on the grass while nox looked down at her with mingled admiration and concern oh never do such a thing again he wheezed severely as handy finally sat up and began wringing the water from her voluminous skirts swimming is an art and must be learned and practiced but for oats sake why didn't you flap all those arms when you hit the water he finished irritably oh is that what you're supposed to do uh, this way before nox could step a step the goat girl had jumped into the river again this time instead of going down she splashed and whirled her seven arms so fast and furiously she just managed to keep her head above water but nox now thoroughly annoyed and without giving her a chance to get far from shore waded in and determinedly dragged her back to dry land what in sky blue onions are you trying to do he sputtered angrily drown yourself <coughs> no i'm trying to swim coughed the goat girl struggling to get away from the angry ox do you suppose i'm going to let this munchkin river get the best of me yes and while you are swimming or rather practicing your swimming some of these keratarians will come and capture us gurgled nox are we escaping or are we swimming 
Quick now, make up your mind. Knox's earnest words brought Handy quickly to her senses, and as the royal ox let go her skirts, she snatched up her weapons and, without waiting to wring out her clothes, started briskly across the meadows. Never mind, you'll be a fine swimmer some day, said Knox, trotting more amiably beside her. The cool river water had refreshed the royal creature, and Handy Mandy's determination and courage made him a little ashamed of his own complaints. Takes a little practice, that's all. Practice, repeated Handy, dripping water from every plat and pour. Well, just wait till we come to the next river. I'll show you. But look, here are more blue houses, so we must still be in the Munchkin country. Yes, but we're out of Carateria, Knox reminded her cheerfully. What's that signpost say, my girl? Hurrying forward, Handy squinted up at the rough board, nailed to a blue spruce, and then began to clinch and unclinch her one free fist. Turn here, directed the sign. Turn here and go straight back where you came from. Well, I'll be buttered, cried the goat girl, throwing down every one of her weapons. I'll be churned and buttered. But what had we butter do? muttered the royal ox, so taken aback by the saucy message that even his tongue was twisted. "'Why, we'll go straight on, of course,' declared Handy Bandy, tossing her yellow plaits defiantly. "'Who or whoever they are to tell us our business?' And recovering her weapons one by one, the goat girl tramped down the crooked lane directly ahead of them, the royal ox with lifted nose and horns stepping warily behind her. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Handy Mandy and Oz by Ruth Plummy Thompson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six Turn Town. Determined as she was, Handy found it impossible to go straight on, for the lane curved and twisted this way and that, ending finally in a perfect corkscrew turn. The trees on both sides were now so dense, Handy and the royal ox could not have left the road even had they wished to do so. "'We're going round and round and getting nowhere,' said Knox in an abused voice. "'Of all the roads in Ox, why did we have to pick this one?' "'Because it dared us, I suppose. hi yi exclaimed Handy, leaning against a tree to rest. I'm dizzy as a bat and hungry as a goat. Too bad you're not a goat, murmured Knox, who had stopped to nibble the lower branches of a maple. These leaves are quite tender. Well, I may come to them, sighed Handy, looking at him enviously. But shall we go on? I think one more turn will bring us out of here. Handy was right, for one more round brought them to the end of Corkscrew Lane, but only to find themselves facing a high, forbidding wall. There was a gate and turnstile in the wall, and beyond the goat girl caught a glimpse of a confused, whirling village, where everything seemed to be turning round or over. "'It's just because I'm so dizzy,' thought Handy, clutching her head with her one free hand. But Knox, peering over her shoulder, gave a loud and indignant bellow, as a house on the corner of the street nearest them turned completely over and began spinning merrily on its chimney, while the fence running round the bakery shop next door started really to run around, kicking up its posts with great glee and abandon. "'Huh! What kind of silly place is this?' rumbled the ox, backing hastily away. But Handy Mandy had seen a whole row of little pies in the bake-shop window, and, motioning vigorously for Knox to follow, stepped over the stile and through the movable gate. It was too much of a squeeze for Knox, but determined not to be left behind, he jumped neatly over. A revolving sign on one of the large public buildings caught their attention at once, 
but as the building was going one way and the sign another it was several minutes before they could discover what it said turn town read the goat girl in some surprise so that's where we are and would you look every house on every street is going round or over mercy on us and where do you suppose the people are turning over and over in their beds i take it it is still quite early you know whispered the royal ox speaking cautiously out of the corner of his mouth but come on the streets are not turning and perhaps if we hurry we can go through before they waken and turn on us hurry hurry what are you waiting for food sighed handy wistfully i thought i might catch us a few pies old toggins here watch my stuff and i'll bring us each some nox looked sharply up and down the street as the goat girl set down her axe rake spade gun broom and sword and started off toward the bakery not only the fence but the shop itself was turning now handy quite cleverly waited till the gate came opposite her and dashed through but the open door of the shop kept going by so rapidly she was knocked down several times before she finally darted inside as she disappeared Knox gave an uneasy snort but cheered up as the shop window came past and he saw handy with a pie in every hand smile at him reassuringly but alas the whirling floor of the shop was too much for the goat girl and as she started out there was a clatter of broken china and falling furniture great gazoo what she done now moaned nox as handy leaped through the door and fell sprawling in the little garden she still had six of the pies clutched in her various hands but as she jumped up and raced through the garden gate windows all up and down the street were flung open from the right side up ones and the downside down ones kinky black heads came popping out by the hundred turn out turn out topsies turn out yelled the excited citizens their voices going higher and higher thieves robbers tramps and standstillians here gasped the goat girl reaching Knox in one bound eat these quick and destroy the evidence stuffing one of the tarts into her own mouth handy made a wry face ugh turnips choked the goat girl dropping the other five in huge disgust who ever heard of turnip turnovers i'll eat them offered nox lapping up the little pies in his stride but run hurry here come the natives but before handy could snatch up her weapons the topsies hurling out of windows and doors came whirling down upon them startled though she was the goat girl could not disguise her interest and curiosity with one arm round nox's neck and the other six stretched stiffly before her to keep back the screeching crowd she stared with round and fascinated eyes and no wonder the topsies were about as tall as children but where their feet should have been they had sharp horny pegs another peg of the same description sprang from each kinky head with their plump hands the small black and blue men and women spun themselves along by cords attached to their round little middles and they kept reversing themselves spinning first on one end and then another in a manner very upsetting and confusing to their visitors the hum made by the topsies spinning and their loud raucous cries filled the early morning air and as handy tried to push her way through the crowd several butted her with their sharp pegs ouch stop that bellowed nox who had been butted too keep still my lass and sooner or later these little pests will run down turn them out turn them out turn them round turn them over shrieked the topsies hysterically in the midst of the dreadful confusion a topsy taller than all the rest came zooming down the middle of the street look standstillians 
shouted a round little spinster waving both arms travelers with legs instead of pegs robbers thieves and tramps your tops justy yes and they have broken into my shop and stolen all my turnip turnovers screamed the topsy baker spinning round in indignant circles aha you wait here comes tip topper now you'll catch it you you turnover snatchers you now you'll catch it shrilled all the rest of the topsies spinning faster and faster till handy and Knox were dizzy from just looking at them except for his size and a flag fluttering from the peg on his head tip topper looked just like his subjects spin spin he whistled angrily what do you mean standing still in the middle of turn town don't you realize you are breaking every one of our rotary laws why are you here did you come to do us a good turn or a bad turn em down turn em out turn em over turn em round insisted the town people shrilly between the revolving houses and the spinning topsies handy mandy scarcely knew which foot she was standing on as for Knox, he gave a great groan and closed his eyes left everything to his companion handy put two hands over her ears and raising all the others addressed tip topper in a firm and reasonable manner tell your people to stand back directed the goat girl calmly all we wish is to pass quietly through your city and never return never she repeated emphatically it was hard to speak to a person who kept going round and round but at every third turn handy managed to catch tip topper's eye and at last he seemed to catch her idea very well then go he commanded haughtily and at once but when handy without stopping to pick up her weapon started forward perfect shrieks of anger rose on all sides not that way not that way turn 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 yelled the topsies and getting back of handy and the royal ox they tried to push them round by main force stop stop it's no use panted tip topper as Knox, letting out a frightful bellow laid seven topsies by the pegs with his left foot and handy with a sweep of her arms swept down ten more they're all made wrong fetch the turncoat drive them to the turning point and we'll turn them to topsies in two shakes of a tent pole um um did you hear what i heard Knox peered desperately round at handy who was now spinning dizzily herself as she was flung and pushed from one group to another could they really turn us to topsies i don't know i don't know oh my head my head moaned the goat girl clutching it with all hands it's going round and round fine fine that's the way cheered the topsies heartily you'll be spinning circles before you know it and have beautiful wool like the rest of us wool gasped handy who was extremely proud of her shining yellow braids oh i wool not that's just too much stand back you little buzzards and i'll show you a turn or two myself go ahead said turn uppins who seemed next in importance to tip topper himself it's your turn anyway stand back topsies and let this waddling wongus show us what she can do at a signal from their leader the turn towners fell back a pace and spinning in a loud agitated circle impatiently waited for the goat girl to take her turn first handy shook her head to dispel the dizziness then with a loud screech she flung her arms and heels into the air in such a succession of hand springs that even the topsies were impressed the seventh brought her back to the royal ox and in the center of a now cheering and admiring circle she turned fifty more so fast that she looked like an animated cartwheel with arms and legs for spokes a loud buzz of applause went up as handy finally fell over from sheer exhaustion but then 
they began pointing accusing fingers at Knox. Look, look at the stupid Gumfalox. Why, he hasn't turned a single hair. How about turning on, then? raged Knox, and tossing a few dozen on my horns. Hop on my back, molass, and we'll make a run for it. No, no, there are too many. We'll be perfectly punctured, worried Handy, as seven Topsies prodded the royal ox sharply in the flank. We might run right into that turning point, too. Wait, wait, I'll think of something. We don't want to spin on here forever, whatever happens. Hugh, Hughie, what a dust the little pests kick up. I'd give my best hand for a drink. I'm choking with thirst. Oh, oh, I wish I were in a river right this minute. Steadying herself by holding to Knox's right horn, Handy faced the angry multitude. Turn, turn, take your turn, shouted the Topsies incessantly. Can't you even turn your head, old foreleg? Of course he can, shouted Handy Mandy, clapping six of her hands for silence. Not only his head, but his horns. Watch this, my friends. The goat girl gave the horn she was leaning on a sharp twist. Not that one, not that one, fumed the ox anxiously. Quick, the other, it's the other one, I tell you. Oh, my hide hair in heavens. Oh, girl, and loop gurgle ope it was with every one for at handy mandy's second turn knox's horn came completely off and as the goat girl held it up for the topsies to see out spurted a perfect torrent of water that flooded the whole city till every turner and topsy-turvy house in it was awash or afloat in wild and astonished voices, the kinky-headed little citizens called out to each other as they bobbed up and down like corks on the raging tide. And, just as wet and surprised as the Topsies, the Goat Girl and Knox were swept along by the impetuous flood. End of chapter 6chapter 7 of handy mandy and oz by ruth plummy thompson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 7 a horn of plenty after the first awful ducking handy without losing a second began to practice her swimming striking out with strength and purpose and her seven good arms she managed to keep abreast of Knox, who was moving easily along in the center of the torrent. Bothersome as the Topsies had been, the Goat Girl could not help feeling sorry for the little turn towners. At first she feared they would all go down, but then they just spun round like water bugs on the surface, and, while they made no progress, seemed in little danger of drowning. In fact, they could no more sink than corks or kindling. So, busy with her own struggles, Handy dismissed them from her mind and tried to figure out the reason for the sudden and overwhelming rush of water that had deluged the city. At any rate, it was fine to be rid of the Topsies, she reflected philosophically, and when the flood did recede, Turn Town would be good as new and twice as clean. The current was racing along so swiftly now, the last Topsy had long since disappeared, leaving only herself and Knox in the broad, tumbling expanse of water. Knox had not uttered a word since his first outcry when the flood had overtaken them, but he looked so glum and disagreeable that Handy, thrashing along beside him, wondered what would be the best way to start a conversation. As it happened, the royal beast saved her the trouble by starting one himself. Well, he snorted bitterly, I see you still have it. What? gulped the goat girl, forgetting to use her arms for a moment, and in consequence shipping about a bucket of water. What? Have what? My horn, horn, gurgled Knox, glaring at her angrily over a wave. And if in the future you will keep your hands, all of them, 
off my horns it will be better for us this seemed to handy a very unjust and unreasonable attitude for Knox to take but she was too occupied keeping afloat to stop and argue the matter swim closer and i'll screw it back she offered obligingly holding up the wooden hand in which she still clutched the right half of the royal headgear but at this poor knox was deluged by a robust stream that still poured from the golden horn hastily plunging it under the surface again handy watched her fellow adventurer emerge sputtering and furious from the depths well of all the stupid tricks gasped the ox swimming rapidly away from her stop keep off don't you dare come near me but see here panted handy going after him in real exasperation uh, after all it is your horn and am i to blame if there is a river inside what do you want me to do throw it away no no bellowed the ox stopping short and looking frantically over his shoulder if you throw it away i'll look like a fool if you keep holding it we'll spend the rest of our lives swimming round in this torrent if you screw it back on my head it will probably give me water on the brain oh what shall we do think of something can't you before we both drown in your stupid old river my river handy mandy was so indignant that for a moment she was perfectly speechless yes your river roared knox treading water angrily didn't you wish for a river just before you jerked off my horn well this is it and i hope you like it why knox how clever of you to guess bubbled the goat girl a great light breaking over her wet head i remember now i was thirsty and wished for a drink uh, then a whole river and lo a river was here you mean high it was here raged knox beginning to swim again but look cried handy beating and slapping the water exultantly with her many hands if that is so all we have to do is wish it away again i'm still holding the horn and there's magic in it old toddywax magic i here and now wish this river away handy yelled her wish in a booming voice that almost split the ox's eardrums and both were so sure the wish would be granted they stopped swimming so both had a fine ducking as the river continued to rush merrily and unconcernedly over their heads bosh it wasn't magic after all my eye if i ever get out of here i'll never go swimming again as long as i live sobbed handy pushing her arms and legs wearily through the water oh i think i'll just sink and be done with it moaned the ox churning breathlessly along beside her you think you'll sink exclaimed handy popping her head up indignantly don't you dare sink and leave me here all alone besides we set out to find that little king and we're going to find him where's your sporting blood water gurgled the royal ox in a faint voice good-bye my lass but you probably did it all for the best it seemed to the goat girl that knox was really sinking so flinging out her leather hand she grasped him firmly by his left horn then acting quickly before he could object handy pushed his head under water and quickly screwed his right horn in place i wish this dumb river would go straight back where it came from quavered handy as knox bellowing and bubbling backed indignantly away and this time the river went so suddenly and completely the goat girl and the ox were dropped forty feet to the bottom of a rocky gorge through which the torrent had been tumbling for a long moment they lay where they had fallen then stiffly they arose and peered anxiously around them handy thanks to her voluminous petticoats was saved from serious injury 
and Knox, who had landed in a patch of brush, was not dangerously hurt either. But they both were so shocked, shaken, and worn out from their long swim, they were perfectly content to stay where they were. Ah, oh, you see, sighed Handy, wringing out her skirts with four hands and smoothing back her hair with the other three. The magic is in the horn and only works when you are wearing it. As soon as I screwed it back and made the wish, everything was all right. Oh, was it? Scowling round at his scratched flanks and skinned shins, the royal ox shook his head dubiously. And just think, continued the goat girl brightly, if your horn really is a wishing horn, as soon as we decide where we want to go, all we have to do is wish ourselves there. No, no, absolutely no more of that, squealed Nox, lashing his tail and flashing his eyes dangerously. Your last wish nearly killed me, and if any more wishing is to be done, I'll attend to it myself. But how can you unscrew or even touch your own horn all by yourself? inquired Handy reasonably. You see, you need my hands, and I need your horns. Throwing back her head, Handy burst into a loud chuckle, thinking how comical she would look if she actually wore Knox's golden headgear. Oh, why not go on the way we started? asked the ox querulously. I'd rather travel on my feet than my horn any day. And had you noticed, Handy, that these rocks are purple? Your river has carried us clear into the Gillikin country, where there are mountains galore, and even a silver one, for all we know. Yes, but is there anything to eat? asked the goat girl in a hollow voice. If these rude little Topsies had just given us some breakfast. I expect all they eat is spinach or turnips, sniffed Knox, and you would not have cared for either. Well, at any rate, we're even. You certainly turn the tide on them, alas. Knox, who was beginning to feel more cheerful, began to shake all over. I'll wager my tail they'll be more polite to travelers in the future. Well, it all turned out so well. Let's make another wish, proposed Handy Mandy, practically. Let's wish ourselves out of here. No use scrambling over all these rocks when all we have to do is to wish ourselves to the spot where your little king happens to be. Hmm, hmm, mused Knox, half closing his eyes. Nothing is as easy as that, and I cannot help feeling. Neither can I, said Handy, and stepping briskly up to the royal ox, she gave his right horn a determined twist at the same time, saying softly, I wish myself and Knox with Kerry the rightful ruler of Carateria. Knox twitched his ears nervously as his horn came off in the goat girl's best white hand, and Handy herself, with all her arms outspread as if she were a bird about to take flight, waited in rapturous expectation for her wish to take effect. But this time nothing at all happened. Neither she nor the ox moved an inch. "'There you are. I told you it wouldn't work,' grumbled Knox, looking at her crossly. "'It's probably not magic at all.' "'Oh, yes, it is,' insisted Handy, screwing up her eye and peering down into the hollow interior. "'It gave us a river when we asked for it, and you can't get away from that.' We certainly had a hard enough time getting away from it, agreed her companion. Come now, be a good girl, screw back that horn, and let's be starting on. But I just cannot understand why it grants some wishes and not others, muttered Handy, discontentedly. When I was thirsty and wished for a river, I got a river. Aha! I have it! This horn gives you things but does not take you places. Now let's see, what do we need the most? Breakfast, suggested the ox in an interested voice. Oats and apples for me, eggs, rolls, and coffee for you. But for goat's sake, be careful how you wish, molass. We don't want too much, even of a good thing. 
and one can drown in coffee or smother in oats. Remember the river and be exact as to size and quantity. Ma I, this wishing is dreadfully complicated. Rubbing her forehead with one hand after the other, Handy Mandy prepared to order breakfast. First she screwed the right horn back on the head of the ox. Then, pursing her lips firmly, she spoke. I wish for Knox two measures of oats and apples, for myself two plates of eggs and rolls and one cup of coffee. Turning the horn round till it came off once more, the goat girl almost held her breath as the two breakfasts were set promptly and noiselessly down on the rock at her feet. Now you're getting the idea. Happily, Knox advanced upon his breakfast. Say, isn't this simply manubious? cried Handy, snapping her thirty-five fingers for sheer joy. Why, Knox, your horn is a real horn of plenty. And plenty of trouble if you don't watch your wishes, mumbled her partner, already up to his ears in oats. Oh, I'll be careful, never fear, promised Handy, screwing the horn back on its base and falling upon her breakfast with a right good will and appetite. Won't the eyes of the villagers at home stick out when I tell them about this? Yes, provided you ever get home, observed the ox, who seemed to always take a dark view of the future. But Handy Mandy, popping the last of the biscuits into her mouth, scarcely heard him. Now that they no longer needed worry about provisions for the journey, she felt that they would safely reach the Silver Mountain, wherever it might be, rescue the little king from his enemies, and restore him to his throne. Then, after seeing all she wished of the marvelous country of Oz, she would return to Mount Mern and startle the country folk with the amazing story of her travels. "'Come along,' she called gaily. "'Let's climb out of here.' With some astonishment, they watched the empty containers and dishes vanish away. And then, saying very little but thinking a great deal, the two adventurers began to scramble up the rocky sides of the gorge. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Handy Mandy in Oz by Ruth Plummy Thompson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight Handy Mandy Learns About Oz. Handy, who had climbed up and down mountains all her life, reached the top of the gorge first, and with her various hands tugged Knox up the last steep incline. So, this is the Gillikin country, panted the goat girl, staring away over the heather-covered highlands. Now, about the natives, do they spin, bounce, or tumble? <clears throat> that I really couldn't say, <sighs> gasped Knox, leaning against a tree to regain his wind. <sighs> but as you can see, my girl, all the hills, trees, and vegetations shade from violet to purple— lovely color purple i suppose purple would appeal to a royal ox like you resting her hands on her hips handy mandy squinted critically about her now as for me i prefer the more cheerful colors red yellow or green for instance then you'd like the quadling and winky countries murmured mox nibbling languidly at the tops of the heather or the emerald city we have all color countries in Oz, and a body can take his choice. Oh, we'll just take them as they come, decided the goat girl sensibly, or at least till we can find your young master and this silver mountain. But tell me, Knox, is each country in Oz a different color, and is there really an emerald city? Moving slowly through the heather, the royal ox nodded his lordly head. Take that stick, he directed coming to a ponderous stop, and I'll show you how Oz looks. See? On that level bit of sand there, just draw an oblong. Quite interested, Handy marked out an oblong with the point of the stick. Connect the corners, breathed the ox, lifting his forefoot complacently. And what have you? 
four triangles answered the goat girl promptly put a circle in the center where all the triangles meet Knox fairly radiated pride and importance as his geosophy lesson progressed then what demanded handy the stick upraised in her rubber hand that's all tossing back his horns the ox surveyed his pupil triumphantly simple isn't it that triangle on the west is the blue munchkin country we have just left the triangle to the north is the purple gillikin country we are just entering over there on the east we have the yellow empire of the winkies and to the south the red lands of the quadlings in the circle is the emerald city of oz and surrounding the whole kingdom is a deadly desert of burning sand ma i marveled the goat girl clasping all her hands but one behind her back the desert i crossed when i fell in Carataria? of course answered nox snapping lazily at a purple dragonfly mount mern must lie to the west of oz on the other side of the deadly desert there are many countries beyond the desert but i know very little about them as there are only oz maps in the castle at home then i suppose the king of Carataria is king of the munchkins said handy looking thoughtfully down at her map oh my no the royal ox positively chuckled at such an idea Carataria is just one of the small countries of the west cheerio bed is king of the munchkins and he lives in the sapphire city seventy leagues below our southernmost borderline glinda the good sorceress rules all the small kingdoms in the quadling country the tin woodman of oz is emperor of the winkies and joe king governs the gillikins besides these there are kings queens and princes galore but most important of all is ozma the young fairy who lives in the emerald city for ozma is supreme sovereign of the entire kingdom of oz dear ear what a lot to remember groaned the goat girl and all these other kings and queens have to do what ozma says however does she keep track of them all i'll bet they're worse than a flock of goats oh she manages said the ox beginning to move slowly forward being a fairy and having a wizard right in her own castle ozma knows what is going on without even turning her head even where we are going exclaimed handy mandy indignantly hi yi what a little busybody i just know i won't like her well in that case she will just have to give up her throne and throw her crown out the window i suppose better have a care molass you're speaking of a powerful fairy you know nox looked so stern as he went ploughing through the heather handy began to feel a little uneasy herself but how could a fairy in the centre of oz see way off here she demanded scornfully magic that's how explained nox looking very calm and superior in her castle ozma has a magic picture that shows her everything she wishes to see i don't believe it scoffed the goat girl swinging all her arms recklessly and besides why would she wish to see us in this particular piece of country at this particular minute i'm sure i don't know said the royal ox haughtily but i do say be careful there what did i tell you framed in the woodwork of a small summer house they were approaching was a large poster you are now in the land of oz stated the poster pleasantly enough be good to us and we'll be good to you keep our laws and practice no magic either for good or evil by order of her imperial highness queen ozma of oz below was the bright green seal of oz and a picture of its pretty dark-haired ruler why she's nothing but a little girl cried handy positively aghast at such a state of affairs how could a little mite like that rule a whole country and be so bossy 
Oh, hush, begged Nox, rolling his eyes anxiously. Might or not, Ozma is a mighty powerful and important fairy. Well, we're pretty important ourselves, sniffed the goat girl, squinting at the poster with all her arms akimbo. And besides, Handy lifted her chin defiantly. We've broken the law already when we used your gold horn of plenty. Practice no magic, huh? What does she expect us to do with good magic right at hand? Starve? But ho, ho, we can get around that, old Toggins. After all, we are not practicing magic. We don't have to practice it. Our magic is perfect. So put that in your pipe and smoke it, Miss Ozma to Bosma. Snatching up a rock in each of her seven hands, Handy flung them hilariously over a clump of prune trees. Yes, prunes already wrinkled grow in the land of Oz. There was an uncomfortable little silence after Handy's rash outburst. Then a perfect tempest of shrieks and screeches. Now see what you've done, gulped the ox, switching his tail nervously. Quick, quick, jump on my back and we'll rush by. These chaps look dangerous. Why, they have hook noses, sputtered Handy, too startled to move, as a band of kilted highlanders came racing down toward them. The noses of these singular hillmen were long and thin, curving out and up far above their foreheads. On these hooks hung dangerous-looking rings, almost as large as barrel hoops. While Handy was wondering what they could be for, the nearest hooker pulled a ring from his nose and flung it with all his might at her head. "'Up, up!' bellowed Knox, pawing the ground in his agitation. "'Are you going to stand there till you are pegged like a top?' The iron ring missed Handy by mere inches, and grasping Knox's horn, she pulled herself to his back. There were about sixty of the hook noses, and swinging to the left, Knox tried to skirt the warlike tribe, but they were too quick for him, and spreading out in a long line, they began hurling their wicked whizzing weapons. One caught neatly on the horn of the royal ox, another hit Handy a hard blow on the knee, and as Knox, snorting and furious, turned to run, a dozen more came wanging down about their ears. Dodging left and right, Handy Mandy leaned forward and began to unscrew Knox's right horn. "'Be good to us and we'll be good to you, huh, like fun you will,' muttered the goat girl, catching six of the flying missiles in her clever hands and tossing them back with all her might." take that and these and them and those pulling off the ox's horn with the only hand she had left she added desperately i wish a barrel of molasses over the head of each hook nose in this band cats bats and billy goats they got me and they had too for just as handy finished her wish down flashed an iron ring pinioning her arms tightly to her sides still grasping the precious horn Handy dug her heels into Knox. Huh! <gasps> grunted the ox, leaping forward. Not hurt, just hooked and humiliated. Can't move a muscle, raged the goat girl. But ha ha, neither can they. Look! Knox, who had been bellowing too hard to hear Handy's wish or miss his horn, glanced back hurriedly. Why, what's come over them? he wheezed in astonishment. Who snuffed them out with barrels, and what's that sticky fluid running all around? Molasses, Handy told him with extreme satisfaction as she tried vainly to wriggle out of her ring. I wished barrels of molasses on their heads, and we'd better dash on while they're stopped and stuck with it. Then you're breaking the law again, reproached Knox, dodging in and out and around their frantic enemies. Well, as between broken heads and broken laws, I choose the laws. Besides, look what they did to me, exclaimed the goat girl indignantly. I may never get this hoop off or be able to lift a hand again. Nice people you have in Oz, I must say. If you hadn't hit them with stones, they wouldn't have hit us with hoops, Knox reminded her sternly. 
at the same time breaking into a gallop to put as much distance as possible between himself and the troublesome Gillikins. A few had managed to lift the barrels from their heads, but most of them were rolling over and over on the ground, half choked with rage and molasses. "'When we stop, I think I can help you,' promised Knox, looking anxiously at Handy, who was now quite purple in the face from her struggles with the hoop. "'Just forget it, can't you, and think of the interesting people we are meeting. I'll wager you have no hook-noses on Mount Mern.' "'I should say not!' spluttered the goat girl in disgust, and then realized she was making no progress with the ring, sensibly gave up the attempt to free herself. Somewhat comforted by the thought that the hook-noses were probably as uncomfortable as she was, Handy kept a sharp lookout for natives. If they ran into any more, she wanted to be sure of seeing them first. But the rocky hills and glades were entirely deserted, and at every step the way became more mountainous and lonely. Knox, panting and wheezing from the long pull, slackened his pace to a walk. Handy Mandy, with some difficulty, managed to dismount, and the ox, slipping his horn under the offending ring, gently forced it upward till the goat girl was able to wiggle free. Then together they climbed up the flinty inclines, up and up, till they came to a wide ledge and a sparkling waterfall. Here they had a drink without having to wish for one, Knox sticking his head right into the water, and Handy cupping three pairs of her hands to hold enough to satisfy her thirst. "'Oh, hum,' sighed the ox. "'I wonder how much farther we'll have to go before we can find anyone who can direct us to this silver mountain. I'm sure I saw some castles when we were below.' "'So did I,' said Handy, screwing his right horn back with a business-like flourish. "'Ma, I, seems a long time since we started from Carateria. Do you suppose they have missed us yet?' "'Probably,' yawned the ox, scratching his back against a rock, while Handy, suddenly deciding she needed another drink, stepped close to the waterfall. But, instead of quenching her thirst, the goat girl spilled water all over her feet. "'Nox! Nox!' she screamed, jerking her thumbs in his direction. "'Come, look here. There's a big hollow behind this waterfall. A high wall of rock with a door in it. I can see it.' "'Well,' sniffed the ox, rubbing his back luxuriously, "'does it say come in? Must we try every door we come to?' Yes, Handy Mandy told him firmly. We must. Where there's a door, there's bound to be a doorkeeper, or at least someone who might tell us where we are. Now then, I'll jump through the waterfall first and knock on the door. There wouldn't be room for you on the ledge until the door is open. Sounds risky, objected the royal ox, putting back his ears. What kind of people would live behind a waterfall? Ask yourself that. But the goat girl, without stopping to ask herself anything, had already plunged through the misty sheet of water, and, gasping and sputtering, was hammering on the door with all seven of her fists. End of chapter 8